And I'm very happy, Dr. Pandey, to welcome you here during this live interview. So thank you very much for your time uh, from France to India. So uh, welcome. Can you please uh, tell me a little bit about you, who you are, and uh, how did you how did you start working in this uh, gender reassignment surgery field? So good afternoon to you, Blanche, in, in, in Paris, and uh, good afternoon to everybody who has joined in from various uh, countries in Europe, uh, which you have so innovatively brought in together. I gather there are doctors and there are colleagues and there are uh, patients in journey in gender reassignment who have logged in from various countries in Europe. And we also have colleagues uh, from the medical fraternity and uh, various uh, people in journey in gender reassignment who are joining in from various Asia pack countries. So good evening to everybody in India and in Asia and good afternoon to all of you back in Europe. It's a very innovative show that you've created. So thank you so much ZSI and Blanche, you and Mary having taken this up in a very short while and done it so well. Uh, I serve as a consultant urologist at the Kokila Ben Dhirubhai Ambani Hospital, where we are three urologists. We form a core team of uh, transplants and reconstructive urology. And we have been supported by students and by medical officers, and there's a full-fledged team of urology. And we have a great support as a multidisciplinary hospital, which is a tertiary care referral hospital in this part of the world, uh, where we have, in this very subject, we have got psychiatrists, we have got gynecologists, we have got endocrinologists, We've got anesthetists who are tuned to the whole procedure. We've got voice therapists and ENT experts. We've got plastic surgeons. So imagine all of them actually form the larger group of this very subject. Which we're going to talk mm -hmm. about. I trained in urology in South India uh, in uh, CMC Velour and Jipma Pondicherry uh, through the training with very illustrious teachers who have given us that pedestal to learn the subject of reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So being into endourology and into minimally invasive urology, but deep into reconstructive urology of genital surgeries apart from other genital urinary organs, it was also an aspect to look into in 2008 when I was an associate professor in Chennai, to look into the subject of reconstructions to the highest possible level. That was the mm -hmm. time Professor Saba Perovic was alive and it was a boon to be uh, with Dr. Miroslav Jordovich and Dr. Saba for a few sessions in this cold wintry times in Serbia at the Belgrade University, you know Miroslav so well. So uh, Miro has been a great teacher and friend for the last uh, 12, 13 years since I've known him. And uh, through his uh, training, which was uh, all between the lines, taught everything in the operation theater starting early in the morning at 5.30, finishing late uh, around midnight, those long surgeries and then the whole team would go together for dinner. Well, so from that know. era, since till now, I think this is 2008, 2009, uh, we dive deep into the subject, but kept it very silent for those patients who go through a journey of agony and discomfort and the kind of trouble that they go through in this part of the world. So the subject has been very close to our heart. And as a team, we perform uh, surgeries of both male to female and female to male gender reassignment surgeries. The passion to drive this subject has not been only to operate, but to uh, go deep into uh, the subject to the patients who don't get the right pedestal to be able to reach uh, the right doctor maybe because not that this subject has got its best uh, kind of platforms in our part of the world but we have had colleagues uh, in Delhi, Dr. Kotwal and plastic surgeons who have been doing this subject for quite some time. We have been only 12 years young in this subject and we are happy to have taken this subject uh, by the very roots of the subject. So with the patients, with caregivers, with families, with partners, and with medical companies like you being so innovative sitting out there, I think things have actually moved. I think so. And I know, well, we met in, in, in a, during your conference, uh, both of us. So you are traveling a lot to, to, to these international meetings in order to meet your peers, other surgeons and, and, and doctors and professors to, to share. And also I saw your, uh, your work, actually, because you gave a, a talk once in, in Italy. So you you are well connected to other uh, international surgeons. So this is this is a very good thing for patients to know that you are also so connected with other uh, maybe techniques and other cultures. True, Blanche. So actually, uh, both with the WPATH and with the EPATH, we have had great connections and colleagues have been very uh, thankfully allowing us those platforms where you could present our uh, subject and our results. 
though it's still very early days 12 years in this subject though uh, quite a milestone but uh, we rate ourselves still humbly down there with with head on shoulders and feet on ground that this subject deserves a better deep and we're working hard uh, to make it uh, take to that levels which has been taken up in europe and america so mm-hmm. i was extremely happy to be the part of the surgeons groups in the epat in the european and the american meetings and just to give you an idea that we also operated live from okilabin hospital to the world congress uh, to wpat in argentina and that was quite a different kind of a situation altogether so feels good to be where we are right now and mm-hmm. we look to innovate and therefore being with innovators like you feels good great thank you very much so i invited you today because i would like to to you to to be able to present to our well the public we have on our social medias and also the potential patients who might ask us so many times uh, where should i get uh, surgery in in india or in asia and i thought it would be great for you to to present us your uh, different techniques for a uh, different kind of surgeries such as metoplasty and phalloplasty and also of course vaginoplasty so we decided together that you would do a different kind of um, interview today so you have some things to show us on the screen so whenever you're ready you you tell me so i've just shared my screen if that's visible to you we could go uh, uh, forward let me know when your screen is visible to you and the audience yes it is it's ready it is yeah yes. so if you want to change the format of the slides while i go forward so saluting everybody in this audience today in at least two continents i know there are americans also joining today but to europe mm-hmm. and asia pack that we have colleagues of both medical fraternity as well as patients in the journey of gender reassignment i think it feels very humbled and proud to be able to take this subject to very high levels today the essentials are the ways forward because we are on facebook live i've kept it very clear that we would be only discussing to stimulate you into the subject which you already doing and to take your journey forward being a patient and to take the subject forward with colleagues who belong to those specialties which i did mention becomes the core group at the kokila ben jurubani hospital so as i speak for the gender dysphoria team to make it short and crisp it is all about stimulating you that i carry greetings from this 16 story institute which i joined 12 years ago we follow a motto every life matters and that's important in every subject both in those difficult subjects like the malignancies and the quality of life subject which a patient goes through like the incontinence and erectile dysfunction today you and i are meeting together to improve the quality of life of individuals to innovate and make it forward into a very high level is what has been our aim the aim in all subjects has been to bring about a change and change with changing times changing times with coronavirus and changing times as candid as we can in a conversation that will have with you so all the bends that we need to negotiate should not be the end of the road we should be able to negotiate unless we cannot make the turn and therefore being a reconstructive urologist myself and my colleague reconstructive urologist in the, in the country who taken the subject to very high levels just to give a little lead and stimulus to all those who possibly would be adding on to the subject a little new gender dysphoria is a new term and gender identity disorder the old term has been discontinued the dictionary defines gender as a state of being male or female typically used with reference to social and cultural differences rather than the biological ones just to read it through dysphoria which is a greek term from the word dysphoros which means hard to bear is a state of unease or generalized dissatisfaction with life compared to euphoria which is just the opposite which means that somebody is keen to come out of it and is keen to come out let's look at of the diseases we know in the world there is a set of diseases we call as rare diseases the last day of every february is celebrated or made aware of by calling it as a rare disease day it was 29th of february 2020 which was celebrated as a rare disease day this is not a rare disease it's not a disease as such it is an entity so we need to wake up to an entity to individuals who go through this burden which are more than sure reckon that it's huge in this society it's huge in all societies which could come from different communities different religions and it's important for us to identify them because as gender dysphoric individuals they look forward and seek to go to the best location to get to the best treatment and it is important for us as colleagues in the medical fraternity to understand their agony that they go through finally before they get to the journey of reassignment so the whole feeling of getting entrapped and keen to come out of entrapment as to whom to go to when will i what instruments what medicine and what man and what machine is what is important i look back to india 
uh, where we are a 1.3 billion population, we look forward to a very high hidden prevalence of this disease, which means that many patients can't come and speak up like in the societies in the Western world where there are different ways of life altogether. Unfortunately, because it's so hidden, there's a huge amount of impact on the quality of life of such individuals. It happens with various needies in various diseases, but out here, the hidden prevalence is such that somebody who could be your neighbor or could be a colleague, could be a gender dysphoric, doesn't know whom to speak. Unfortunately, therefore, it's underreported, underdiagnosed, understudied, and sadly, undertreated and undercured. That's a universal symbol which we respect so much as the third gender, looking at helping and taking them in a journey and as medical fraternity and as colleagues who combine together on this subject. It was always looking like gender dysphoria was a very complex that we probably did not know. To me too, approximately 12 and a half years ago, when I was not knowing the subject very well, though being a reconstructive urologist and looking at some of the some of the leftovers or the complications coming from the Western world and from the Thailand group and from various colleagues from plastic surgery, I was always looking at how to take this subject forward to the highest level. So my attempts at that time also was to make impossible to possible, finally treatable and finally curable for those individuals whom we could take forward to the highest possible level. And we knew that gender reassignment surgery was a culmination of the journey for the individuals who seek that kind of a reassignment altogether to finally come to a level that they want to and they want to see. So under the Hippocratic Oath, under the very important boundaries as a urologist, as a reconstructive surgeon, and as a gender reassignment surgeon for me, I might do uh, wonderful colleagues in the Department of Urology who actually have been uh, the pillars of this important program in the pelvis that you've taken forward in the last decade plus, according along with the other teams which have helped us out at Kokila Bain. We have looked at it from a very strong perspective to take this. While we were looking at defining the subject, taking it forward, and the paradigm shift was happening in the world, which is very important for us to today, uh, really accept it and move forward, was this important organization called WPAP, World Professional Association of Transgender Health, where you see as many patients, as many doctors who come in around, intermingle, understand each other, and that's how the subject has grown so well. I've been seeing it since the days 2009 in Chicago, and we moved forward to Thailand in 2013, and then uh, to Amsterdam, then to Argentina. We be looking forward to making it better and better as the WPATH meets later this year, attempting to reincarnate ourselves from being doctors alone to be friends to these patients around. It is important to understand their journey, understand the nuances that they go through and the kind of difficulties they go through. And finally, they still stand very strong. Therefore, the focus that a gender dysphoria individual has is absolutely awesome. We salute each of these individuals who go through, sadly, gender dysphoria journey and finally get corrected. To me today, it's to connect these dots to a subject and therefore attempting to reincarnate, taking the load of the patients who could come in around and we could help them. With Nassali has been the motto at Coquilabain Hospital and with all of us as medical fraternities who watch this presentation today, teamwork has been the key. That has been the motivation to go across the table and help the individuals who happen to be patients out, which means combining the man, the machine, the medicines and all those which we can combine together and the Monday evening that we're combining together. The issue is when do they present? They present at, at times which could be as early as late adolescence, and it could be as late as in the 50s when everything is done. I remember the patient who was 49 years young, who came from the United States of America, whom I operated. She, uh, she actually understood that she was gender dysphoria at the age of 25 after she had given birth to a child. She did wait for 24 years, for the girl to actually settle down and then agree to undergo the journey of gender reassignment. So for us, patients at that age group, when they undergo that entire journey, to go to that level is important. Therefore, there's a scientific slide just to give an idea that there is this important determination as to what leads to this important aspect of gender dysphoria, which has not been studied so well, whose work is happening dramatically in various countries at this point in time. If you look at the last three things, which means criteria of determination where pattern of behavioral center, sex of assignment and rearing, and psychosexual differentiation, which are from prenatal to perinatal to something imprinted by the environment as we undergo a diamorphic differentiation to a psychosexual differentiation of a lifelong entity to finally undefine the issues of gender. It is all about anything going wrong in the pattern of behavioral center, the assignment and rearing of the sex, and finally, the psychosexual differentiation could lead to this state called gender dysphoria. 
the attempt at transition that happens to them and as they evolve into those whole subject, it is important to understand that they are seeking a transformation. That is what we do for correction, which means we're almost looking at an irreversible step as we move forward. Surgery can never change the biological steps. Very important. And surgery provides a reasonable approximation of genitalia. Let's mm -hmm. confess that we as human beings on the opposite side of the table, as doctors trained and probably gone to high level of finesse, could still do a justice of improving the condition to very high levels to be able to give them that level of uh, transformation which they seek. But I know that they cannot procreate on their own, which means they could be surrogacy. And there are laws of the land in every country. This, is, this subject has its own legality. And therefore, to fit into the legal affidavit of the country is an important step. Therefore, the transformation that we bring about by a gender reassignment surgery needs to be understood because we are bridging a gap. We are bridging a gap for social reasons, for medical reasons, need of a multidisciplinary team because it's not me, it's we. We is stronger than I. Nobody can do this alone. And it's always that the laws of the land apply towards the freedom for them to transform themselves and go to the highest possible level. So bridging the gap has to come a combination of science and society both takes together. And that's where WPATH has played a huge role. It actually has gone all the way to get the seven and the eighth version of guidelines for both the patients as well as the clinicians who actually are enrolled and are a part of the entire team. So partly being governed by the standards of care where we take forward the subject to highest possible level, which includes uh, the medical management, the psychosexual activities, the somatic activity, and looking at completely treating them around. Gender reassignment is not about treating the mind. Since history and since days beyond, we know that trying to reward, trying to coerce, and trying to force has not helped this entire subject. It's a very focused mind, a mind which may look different to us who are cis, but at the same time, it's important for us to understand that they are going through a trauma very deep inside. Attempting to treat the mind to adjust to the body has always been ill-defined, has always met with failure. It is important to understand gender reassignment is about gender reassignment journey, which means consisting of understanding a patient who probably comes to you as a clinician. That is the diagnostic phase to diagnose that somebody doesn't have an overnight journey of undergoing a transformation. It's a, it's a deep-seated dream and deep-seated desire and deep-seated innate feeling from inside which an individual goes through when he looks at that I am a gender dysphoria. This whole diagnostic phase across the world is supported by mental health professionals, which are psychiatrists and psychologists. This is followed then by your hormone therapy, who is by an endocrinologist, and we have got three young colleagues doing that for us at Coquilla Bain Hospital. They live a real life experience and we study them across to understand that they're almost through. They're just looking at the journey being completion. And that's where we look at the gender reassignment surgery, which is reaffirming faith in the medical fraternity of taking them. So all good things take time, like this good thing of uh, ZSI innovating such an important platform for colleagues in matter of medical fraternity who always seek to know more questions and answers is what is important. So when we look at embracing change for success with the teamwork, we always change goal force as we understand more. So that a single broom cannot treat everybody, a single medicine cannot treat everybody. We need to have defined dosages and therefore define and understand each of them, very important. So when we do that, we look at giving them a realistic understanding of what we can create. I understand that individuals with gender dysphoria have got expectations which must be close to 100%. And I gather that as reconstructive surgeons, reconstructive urologists, me and my colleagues like my teacher Miroslav Jordovich back in Serbia, we all look at taking it forward to the highest possible levels when we attempt that. So when it came as 2020, we understood that gender dysphoria burden and challenge was only seeming bigger and we wanted to unravel the subject and open it up. It was also important to share the burden with my colleagues who actually have taken up the subject in this part of the world, which includes the SARC countries and the Asia PAC countries. And we also look at exchanging the entire burden and looking at helping both colleagues as well as patients take it forward. So today it's a wake up call and this wake up call is to identify the individuals, evaluate them properly, not to be in a rush hour, give them the realistic expectations, right from treating to curing them, and making that what was, what was my dream in 2008, making an impossible to possible or I am possible. That is, I can do something for them. So together, yes, we can. And we have done it. And it now feels proud. And really, uh, uh, the challenge that we have taken forward has come light. It's today that we live in an era of stress. We live in an era of various innovations. And ZSI is an amazing innovation 
right for the last few years you come up so tall believe in era of competitions and era of evidence based models only setting standards of highest order to be able to take all the question and answers today will take it forward towards extreme degree of safety in our patients across the country and the world in gender dysphoria scenario i remember in 2008 9 when we were looking at transgenderism and looking at the stuff the media was of great help to us and remember the the media and the society was still very very cautious on the right when you look at uh, something which comes from my city surgery to set gender uh, right gets a very cautious acceptance 12 years ago things were different the world has changed dramatically when we look at it in 2010 when we opened up a gender clinic for the first time in the country which was a multifactorial team one of the patients said a surgeon's knife set me free that means i was waiting for it to get sorted out so we have moved from that 2010 when we had the first individual who underwent a male to female in 2010 it is 10 years since we have done all this and it feels really good to innovate our techniques to take it forward to the highest possible levels as i said we as a team and i as an individual look at getting to the society and helping individuals and uh, ngos and and groups around we also powered an awareness documentary on this which came up last year where i was a part and parcel of the entire journey of a 20 minute documentary which is there on the youtube by name anna in bengali with english subtitles to help it out so to reach the society to reach via youtube and to take this subject forward to the highest possible levels last year it was a, a dream come true when i could talk to audience the virtual audience or the live founded audience who were agreeing to look at this subject of dysphoria to euphoria and today that's what you are doing innovating at zsi making people euphoric by the kind of uh, situation that you create from the various kinds of implants created so this uh, ted talk is very much available out on the youtube and uh, there's a different kind of a talk which gives us a realistic idea about what gender dysphoria means to society and to a surgeon and to a team i would encourage people to open the tedx ies mcr see the platform which gave us a chance to reach all of you and reach my colleagues and reach patients on this journey to be able to finally take it forward so that's a 16 minute talk which gives you an idea about it finally they all say i love my doctor it could be a urologist it could be an endocrinologist it could be a plastic surgeon it could be a voice therapist it could be a psychiatrist it could be a gynecologist and finally it could be an anesthetist all of them are involved in your transition and your journey to take you forward to the highest possible levels and therefore it's a wake up call today life comes a full circle to me 12 years after we started working and 10 years after we started the clinic all of us who deal with gender dysphoria from this building sitting here and this country where we are in today to all of you sitting in europe and in asia pac countries today truly on a monday it's a wake up call because the dark clouds are disappearing we are having sunlight again on this subject and many more subjects that we deal with with utmost importance to me like india is glittering the world is glittering and we will together probably make things better and forever therefore to me as a thank zsi for having created this platform and all of you who have taken your post lunch session in europe and the pre dinner session or the tea session to come in for a chat show on this awareness is a need today on this very important subject we should hand hold this subject like all subjects management is always a team work we is stronger than i and implementation of this is truly a challenge i would uh, close this at this point in time uh, blanche and probably wait for the questions which could have come thank you thank so you much. Very much here we are thank you very much for this very interesting presentation and very complete actually i think it's very important always to come back to the basics of what are we talking about and not only just the surgery but also what is uh, gender dysphoria so thank you very much for uh, giving an overview because also we, we realize that many times there are some uh, friends of transgender people or, or parents or families who don't really know what it is about uh, what we are talking about uh, gender dysphoria and i think it's really important that we we can also give this kind of information uh, also so thank you very much for this um so facebook is not allowing us to show any results or anything so Absolutely. this is why we stopped the the powerpoint unfortunately but um uh, we can still have a casual conversation about your techniques um, uh, i know you you do a, a large uh, spectra of techniques and um for different kinds of surgeries so i don't know if you want to to start maybe with metoplasty phalloplasty um, and maybe afterwards yeah. with vaginoplasty you should, you yeah. should. 
just because as you rightly said launch that we on a facebook live will not be able to show anything on the surgical aspect i was only stimulating myself and the audience to look at this subject needs a, a daring importance by team work it is never i i so rightly as you said if i say i anywhere please pardon me for that it's always we back in department of urology and in the hospital here so to start with yes your question is absolutely bang there but audio plasty or fellow plasty when we look at ftm surgeries true mm -hmm. uh so when we look at the mindset of an individual who is going through a journey we also understand their expectations but they they the same time we got to look at what is the evidence and what is my experience on the subject and how to take it forward for an individual who is f2m and wants a metaoidioplasty and very much understand that they are the ones who understand that they are looking at a solo gratification sexually they are also looking at attempting to stand and pass urine So remember, gender reassignment surgery is not for sexual gratification to start with. This is all deep in the mind at that point in time, which we never know because we have never questioned them in their late teens or early twenties. But we have got them across the table at that point in time. So we understand that they are coming out of entrapment, and the first thing could be looking like I am a male. That means I want to go and pass urine in a gender-free toilet or probably standing, which is what they want to look at. They also want to look at the genitals, which. is a little different from what they wanted and that's what they always feel why me god so we're looking forward to metaoidioplasty individuals or frame of mind is i'm looking for a single stage surgery dr pandey where i want to stand and pass urine in a male toilet and i'm good enough i can gratify myself and dot enough if i look at somebody who has got a mindset for phalloplasty it's very clear that they are the individuals who are looking at possibly a journey which in my understanding could be a little longer than a metaoidioplasty with a metaoidioplasty is a single stage surgery compared to phalloplasty which could be stages depending on the the teams which perform where they want to be both standing and passing urine which could they don't mind waiting for some time on that but at the same time want to be active on a performance with a partner which means they want a phallus they want a functional aesthetic and a sensate phallus which is a capable organ altogether so to me those patients who are for metaoidioplasty are a very set of individuals they come in and say i'm looking forward to this would you help me choose between a and b uh between a lamborghini and a ferrari or they would say that uh, i have decided that this is my journey i have understood it i so let me tell you in today's world beat france be in romania and in serbia where colleagues are watching us live individuals in gender dysphoria are completely focused they know the subject so well so they choose their metaoidioplasty and their phalloplasty with care uh there are individuals who would love to switch around but i know that these two individuals are completely different so they could be transitions later So we cannot really say that, for example, metoidioplasty is the first step to phalloplasty. Uh, so there are some individuals who could be shaky enough. Like I have a request which came yesterday from a different country, for whom I did a metoidioplasty seven years ago, okay. with but pertinent questions on the emails and on the video calls we made before the individual got a visa and came to India and underwent that four and a half hour surgery has been good for the last six years. In the mm -hmm. last one year. there has been a partnership and understanding and understand that the sensate organ that the individual has metaoidioplasty is all about very sensate organ because it's still a part of the sensate organ which has been changed and uh, probably made into a pudding but now he understands his partnership is there and he has moved on and now he wants to change so metaoidioplasty may not be a step towards phalloplasty but in individuals who have decided to undergo a change months years or decades later could still get a phalloplasty even after a metaoidioplasty Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um could you explain a little bit uh about what is the very very fast what is the the surgery in how does it consist the metoidoplasty because sometimes people are not familiar with these terms so we okay. can okay. I will. So metoidoplasty blanch is actually a single stage surgery where a uh, post gender reassignment uh certification and hormone therapy be expecting the clitoris to enlarge because there are male hormones on which could anything between 3 months to 3 years to longer to and then you are actually converting this entrapped clitoris into a small phallus into an adolescent phallus kind of picture so that's where we do a surgery where we remove the moorings or the entrapments of the clitoris which is now enlarged hormonally and we straighten it up now the clitoris is a hidden structure and quite a bent structure the only part visible on a clitoris is the hood or the tip of the glands we unroof the whole thing and make it a long one we have achieved uh, in the world we have achieved anything between 4 to 7 cm depending on the hormone enlargement because the surgeon will attempt his best way to enlarge it to the highest possible limits once you have done that 
remember this is a sensate organ because it has got the corporal bodies yeah we thereafter look forward to giving them a urethra that's where we do a urethroplasty in that same stage so there is a vaginectomy where we clear the vagina we give anterior vaginal wall flap we create a urethra partly from that partly from the graft from the mucosa and cover it with skin so something which was hidden like this deep inside is straightened up given its due length so that it can help stand and pass urine it has got a urethra created till the tip the urethra was here because that is how it was now this opening is brought all the way up here and you have a small phallus not capable of a coitus or a performance but good enough to stand past urine so this is a technical demanding surgery where you are creating a phallus out of the clitoris you are creating a urethra on the same stage closing the vagina on the same stage and getting the patient to pass urine 2 weeks later great thank you very much so the comparison with phalloplasty actually is even not comparable because phalloplasty is there is a, a way bigger morbidity and it's many stages so can, can you explain a little bit your techniques so phalloplasty to me since we since we trained with with serbians uh, the big masters out there both professor sawa and dr miroslav it was latismus dorsi flap which was their pet flap and they did it extremely well they reached that high level in 20 years which will take our own time to but then i came back to india and understood that we had a different need altogether our mm -hmm. patients may not be so tall we have shorter patients you don't want to give them a very long phantom phallus which is of no good remember till you don't have an organ you are craving for it the moment you have an organ you understand it's too big or too small compared to what is god given something which is god given which is grown with time in your body you accept it as a part of your body mm -hmm. something which a surgeon gives you in 6 to 8 hours of surgery and that looks too small or too big because it will not match your expectations and that's therefore i use a very important word called realistic expectations we need to bring down okay. the realism and say that what you saw in the youtube or what you saw with your colleague in a different country may be different for different reasons altogether this is your body and it's my life that very important song so it's my life and i need to get my life sorted out and therefore the phalloplasty that we do today are pedicle flaps back at kokila ben hospital which is either mm -hmm. a skip flap or an alt flap or the prior flap which has actually held a great test of time so the pedicle flaps have been good enough they are stage surgeries that we do we do a phalloplasty as first stage patient stays in the hospital anything between 7 to 9 to maximum 10 days and they go off to different cities and different countries where they come from the organ matures the partner and the patient accept the organ they continue to live with it they get a partial sensation to it they come back for the next stage which could be a urethroplasty or a implant of the semi uh, malleable kind of processes which we do So we do a stage surgery back at Kokila Ben Hospital. It has done well, except obviously we all deal with our own complications and complications coming from outer world. So I respect that we, as this complex surgical maker, have our own trouble also, which we need to continue getting better. Thank you. So, for example, the scrotoplasty. Uh, in which moment do you do it to create? So the scrotoplasty to me. So back in India, I kept scrotoplasty as possibly one of the last surgery when the journey is almost over. That means. we could actually do that and we have done in few cases is about putting an expander in advance and the mm -hmm. expander allows us to get that kind of a skin which can later on be crumpled and shrunken and that can be in place with this blood supply which could help us to possibly put the the the, the testicular process later on so scrotoplasty can come from the labia and a little later on compared to the more important organ which many of them in india and in asia pack countries demand as a urethra which is possibly the most challenging part of the whole surgery This is this was my next question. Do you automatically do the urethra, or do you prefer not doing it, or is it according to the patient's uh, real expectation? What what do you do? Good one. That's a good question. So remember, every individual is different. A is not equal to B is not equal to X and Z. So individuals decide and they take their own time. Not necessarily that, as I said, the the benchmark could be every three or six months. Individuals come and they come after six months, even after a few years. We had a patient in the lockdown. we actually came up to 3 years to look forward to an implant being mm -hmm. now that they have a partnership they're moving on in a possibly married life he wanted the implant that everything is working so to me the urethroplasty happens to be the interim stage and a stage where the shaft has matured in terms of its shrinkage if at all yes. we give them a shaft anything between ranging from 12 to 15 cm from the the pedicle flap which we can create no longer than that let me confess because any longer than that will be a phantom phallus With the blood supply and the sensation at the tip may be much lesser than what is desired. Mm -hmm. So we create the phallus. We create a urethra by a tunnel approach. We create what Miroslav also does back home in Serbia. 
is about creating a pedicle flag from the perineum. The urethra has two components. What is the perineal urethra or the bulbar urethra, which is the male bulbar in the perineum, which can come from the anterior vaginal wall flap. And therefore, I request whenever somebody undergoes a hysterectomy and oophorectomy, the vagina not to be disturbed. That's mm -hmm. a very important resource organ for me to be able to create flaps and take those flaps towards continuity of a urethra forward around. So the urethroplasty, that stage is important. We normally can do that stage. Along with that, we attach the perineal flap to the phallus. So that mm -hmm. completely is attached to one go. Many patients would say that I only wanted a phallus. I want to still pee from below, but I wanted myself to look coming out of entrapment. So again, as individuals, patients desire when they want to. Majority of them look forward to urethroplasty in between six months to two years for sure. Implants mm -hmm. sometimes have come before urethroplasty, but more frequently after urethroplasty. Remember, our phallus are not huge in terms of the girth. We've got to be very careful of where to implant the urethra, where to implant the, uh, where to implant the, the processes. And therefore, it's always the processes goes dorsal, uh, goes dorsal, and uh, the urethra goes ventral. That is what is a normal biology. I see. And do you use do you use buccal mucosa for uh, to to, to yeah. join those parts of the urethra? Yes. So both in metodioplasty to give the dorsal only, and mm -hmm. also in urethroplasty for the phalloplasty group. Buccal mucosa serves only as a graft, and we use grafts quite frequently and quite sparingly to look at uh, where to use it around. So that balance is completely on the table. We almost take a blanket request from the partner from the family that we're looking at creating a urethra. When we create an organ like urethra, it should have its blood supply. We may not be able to meet the match when we go to the operating table. You always have to make those changes around. So buccal mucosa happens as a resource. And we use buccal mucosa sometimes very sparingly when it's a graft. But when it comes to a tubularized flap, it's always a flap which is created from the perineum. So buccal mucosa very much is a part of both. I see. So until, uh, until last December, Zephyr had not reached India yet. So you know the processes for many years, but you, you were not able to, to use them yet. So can you please explain me a little bit what, um, if you always use um, uh, devices for phalloplasty, or sometimes you have people ask, not asking for them, or how is it? Did is you ask me a question? Did you? Yeah. Is the finality of phalloplasty having any, uh, a device implanted? So is it a like oh, yeah. third wonderful. Thing? Wonderful question. So we are talking about a complex ablative and reconstructive surgery where the journey is towards final completion. Mm -hmm. 80 to 95% patients would look at a final completion in a phalloplasty, which means they would look at, this is a sensate, aesthetic, and a functional organ created by a reconstructive urologist. Mm -hmm. We look forward to helping them out in the journey by making them understand realistically across an understanding, across a debate, across an argument, whatever you call to work with a learned person, to be able to take this journey by an understanding. When we look at the final completion, majority of them would like to use it for coitus, for a performance, and therefore, other than the prior flap where many patients can be in a non-missionary position and can perform, majority of them would require an implant. Back in India, in the kind of phallus we create, we almost always have been using the uh, malleable implant uh, as a part of the whole process. So uh, until last December, till uh, last year before last WPATH and the EPATH where I met you in Rome and looked at the entire innovations from the first to second generations that you have created back in ZSI. Yeah. Uh, we were using implants, the Indian implant, which is a Shah's processes, which is a very versatile processes, standing its test of time for two decades, both for cis men and for trans men in the country. We have been using that. It's, this with, kind, uh, of, um, it's not the same brand, and, but it's this kind of, of processes. Yes, so that is what it is. That's unfortunately that is what we have in India, which is a semi rigid rod which is malleable and you can bend it. Can you show me the bend? Can you just bend it across? Yes, so that is how malleable it is. Exactly, super. So you have a high quality stuff at ZSI, absolutely. So that is what we have back from an innovator from India called Dr. Rupin Shah, an endrologist. Absolutely, that's it. So we have that in India as a double piece, and he did justice to endology and, uh, and this entire work. And I use that process as a single device because we don't need two devices. It's all about giving the rigidity across a scaffold. So when we do that, I understand that we had our own limitations. And therefore, I became an innovator, like in many of the steps we innovated back in India in the last decade. So this innovation was to look at how to be able to implant these processes and keep it fixed rather than migrate. 
because we had early days where there was a migrating and the migration exactly so it would migrate partly because of the hinge partly because we had to cut and move it around but i gather that what we were doing back in operating table is what you have done as a lead that means you have a fixator can you show me that implant which is a single implant absolutely so i was stunned i was absolutely stunned at the epath when you showed me this because you have that fixator which is what i was creating with a proline mesh you have that sterile fixator which goes on the process absolutely so that's that's awesome that's that's beyond understanding so you have those serrations which can walk in easily into the phallus and that is, can you just show it across the background of your black shirt so it actually comes in well put down oh, exactly nice. so for the audience who may not be knowing it this is to me world class it's coming from the outer world and to me it's world class i have been absolutely thrilled to look at this being used immediately after lockdown gets open we're going to get this in india and this is going to be amazing because it has got a fixator and this is the fixator exactly so these fixators are so important because they fix it up they fix the position dorsally on the phallus they don't let it go they are those malleable ones can you show me the malleability so you have actually been so instead of a steam engine you've got a robotic engine right now that's fine completely so it moves well and i'm extremely impressed that this is what you showed me and i was looking at only one man seeing now the whole world sees the way it is through the eyes of the facebook so mm -hmm. to me we used to fix it with a proline mesh and would look at it not getting explanted on its own or not migrating and we were always worried about infection we had an explantation rate only because of the infection which are happening around i went back to the innovator dr rupin shah and talked to him and looked at all that i could do to innovate so we have moved forward but what you have done today is innovation by creating a platform for the society and for doctors mm -hmm. and for all of us you also innovated in the last n number of years taking it generations forward by getting a fixator for the semi rigid one what i have not used and i want to confess yeah that that one that's very good you want you want to tell me a little bit about that you yourself want to tell me something about that about that fixator about the fixator this one yeah yeah oh well actually this is this is the first version which was a, a very a rigid plate and yeah. now we have a new version also we try to to improve the devices because so uh, we decided not to make it so so full and so rigid so we yeah. proposed like a a, a across um yep. something like this in order to be able to fix it to have it more malleable because the that's right yeah. Is more, yeah so it, it can actually take a full bend exactly. it could take a full bend yeah yeah that's it good one so uh i have not used something called as inflatable processes and you happen to be the leader in inflatable processes of a single can, can you show me that please and that was a completely a bombshell when i saw it because we didn't have a single piece processes uh by any of the world leaders of the past so you lead the subject on gender and on single processes and that's great that is something where you have a reservoir that is something where you have um, so we have a plant and that's where yeah a pump awesome. unit which is also a, a testis prosthesis actually yeah and i will show you this is a big size so it takes a little bit of time that's right that's right yeah prepare it Yes. Got it. So it's one thing. It's a single in, in comparison with cis gender processes that are made of two two cylinders. We have just one cylinder with a, a preformed glands and the passage for the urethra also. If you have a urethra lengthening, so and rigidity is is amazing. So that's historic to me. I would say that's absolutely. historic it stands uh, as a at a as a pedestal in time for having created this because it was always in our mind in the operating room as to how to get a single piece processes and you defined it yeah here it is ready for you to use it thank you so much so that's coming to india soon we got to use it for the needy patient because there is a request for that kind on the larger alt phallus and the kind of absolutely great um yes absolutely uh so as you, as you know we we are keep, keeping all the questions for the end of our end interview so we are receiving some questions um if you are okay i don't have more questions about holoplasty maybe just one do you receive sometimes patients who already have for example a metoidioplasty or a phalloplasty and who want a revision or implantation of device or a urethra lengthening from outside of mumbai or outside of india do you receive foreign patients oh, yes so uh, we uh, at kokilaben hospital in all the specialties receive patients from all over the world okay. i've had 
I personally, but the other departments too, cardiac and oncology and orthopedics and name a department because all these are all centers of excellence in various departments. They get patients from the Asian countries, which includes the Gulf nations, the Southeast Asia, mm-hmm. uh, our colleague borders from all over the South countries and patients from Africa and the outer world. Also, the Indian expats who are in different countries do come back for surgeries back in India. They, they can be the family and get treated and be nursed very well and have post op recovery. So as a hospital, as institute and as a department, we get patients from various parts of the world. And therefore, that this subject has been so niche uh, back in India and has been taken over with a multidisciplinary team and with understanding of science and the laws of the land and the regionalism, including taking the government rules into understanding. I gather that we do have got patients in the last 10 years from almost all over the world, which means Europe, few Americans. Uh, we have had patients from Pakistan, from Burma, few waiting in Bangladesh, few waiting in Sri Lanka to be coming in once possibly things ease out. Okay. So patients from each country comes out and not many patients come from Mumbai, let me tell you. Mumbai happens to be the financial okay. capital and the district where uh, we have, Mumbai has a huge population and all of them are really busy with the robust life they lead in. But patients do come from, from all provinces in India, which includes deep north. I had a talk with somebody late in the evening yesterday from Agartala, who possibly is watching this live, was very keen to know. And people come down in the south. I, having come from North India, trained, born in East, trained in South, and now working in Western India, it gets easy to be multidimensional, understanding the ethics of this subject with the language we want to speak around. And it's helping very well. So patients do come in requesting for change. Patients do come in requesting for revision. And uh, our colleagues in plastic surgery have taken, kept the subject alive while we urologists were still looking at taking the subject to the highest possible level that we have arrived as urologists and reconstructive urologists. I think it looks good because my colleagues in India have taken this up to very high levels already. So I'm mm-hmm. just representing them and representing the entire uh, urology society of India on this very subject where we are uh, in complete lead with the subject and helping colleagues and patients out. So patients do come from all over. They come for a primary case. They come from redo revisions. We also have our own trouble mm-hmm. in many patients around. We have had trouble to explant a phallus sometimes because this is a pedicle. We have trouble of explanting the processes at times. So it should completely be hoped that the more we do, possibly more we will see of good and bad both. And mm-hmm. therefore, very realistic expectations on the counseling and making them understand that it's a journey where an individual called a human being, which could be anybody in shape of you, anybody who is attempting to do good to you and we only mean good. That means... Every life matters and we want to improve it. Great, exactly. Thank you very much for this answer. So maybe we can uh, switch to a little bit of um, uh, M2F um, surgeries and maybe focus more on your techniques of vaginoplasty. Yes, M2F has been close to my heart because the first surgery we did was M2F. Mm -hmm. Believe me, back in uh, with Professor Miroslav, the most complex of the phalloplasties were more visible and M2F was less. So when I came back, there was a ground reality of attempting to start the multifunctional team and it was a little time before we started. So M2F was always an innovation as we kept doing and presenting in the world fora and getting mm-hmm. the hints and leads from various uh, dimensions and all these authorities in the world. So M2F that we do are of two kinds and both are multi- single stage surgery of immense kind. The one mm-hmm. that we do, which is from the native uh, penile uh, urethral flap is a penoscrotal inversion, which is something that we do and we're able to achieve the length demanded of Indian and Asia packed patients of anything between five to six inches. Obviously, I was telling somebody yesterday to do the depth or the length of the organ that we create, a lot mm-hmm. is dependent on the organ that is available. So for yeah. example, for a penile disassembly and removal of the organs and then creation of the vaginoplasty, where in a male to female single stage five and a half hour surgery, which we demonstrated one live to the Urology Society of India conference and one mm-hmm. later on or two. It is all about removing those parts which are the corporal bodies and the testis, preserving the blood supply, the neurovascular blood supply, creating a proper clitoris, which is a sensate organ, strategically posed just above the urethra, mm-hmm. doing a urethroplasty by a perineal urethrostomy, and then the vaginoplasty. The vaginoplasty is both for, again, for the region of aesthetic from the external features of labia majora and minora, and from the region of functionality and the, the sensations of the inner organ called the vagina, which we create and we fix, we innovated to use very specific instrument, which we presented in the World Congresses from Thailand to Chicago, way late, later on to Amsterdam, was to look at these patients getting the vagina, which is a fuller depth in android pelvis, to go to mm-hmm. those depths we innovated with various laparoscope instruments. So the penoscotal vaginal flap has stood test of time. Patients whom we have seen even after a decade, that means the 2010 patient whom I did show, who 
was actually taking the journey test. We started the whole clinic and all. But still having a depth of 5.5 to calibrate. The quietness is the best form of calibration. She continues to calibrate still every week. Like patients do it every every day for the first three months after we start it after three weeks mm -hmm. and proceed further till six months. So that the wound that we create as a vagina, which is a wound, should not tighten up. But we took a lead forward in this subject of vaginoplasty in terms of being able to do robotic assisted vaginoplasty. So that was the lead which we started last year. And did we, we this innovation came, came from those patients who were MRK syndrome and vaginal atresia who were females completely and had no vagina. So there are females born without a vagina, like men born without a phallus. And these women born without a vagina and having only a uterus and therefore hematometra, which are referred by gynecologists. And those MRK syndromes where their only ovaries look very beautiful women, but no uterus and no vagina, got a vaginoplasty from the robotic kind. So those who underwent those kind of vaginoplasty as females have actually got married. I was a part of one of the marriage ceremonies because she was a complete woman, acceptable to a man and possibly could take a life forward. So from there onwards, we attempted to do a robotic assisted vaginoplasty, which is a single stage sigmoid colon vaginoplasty or ileal vagina, which stands with two blood supplies. We create an organ, which is anything between 12 to 15 centimeters, maybe even longer, but that becomes a ghost organ if you make it longer than that. It has an axis. And I think it works very well. So those patients have undergone a sigmoid vaginoplasty. Approximately 20, 25 of them in the last two years, three years, are happy enough. There's always this worry about excessive mucus, which undergoes a metaplasia. So that mucus is more of a lubricant. So it can be initially nasty like anything new which is being created. Patients do learn because they accepted this body is theirs. They will only polish the body and get better and better in the journey. So that has been accepted. Great. So, um, for example, if, if, uh, if a patient had uh, hormone blockers, sometimes it happened that they, they get blockers very, very soon, very early age. So in this case, sometimes the phallus is not is not long enough. There is no no not thin enough to have the penile inversion. In this case, what what do you do? Do you do you mix both uh, kind of uh, surgeries, or do you choose the colon? Good one. Uh, Good one and very complex question because this has not been asked to me ever in any fora. So let me tell you that this is a brilliant question. I'm glad I'm here. So to start with, number one, there are there are patients because I said. We are a little shorter height compared to many of this, uh, the patients who come from abroad. And there are shorter shafts around. Therefore, to have realistic expectations to have that compared to this becomes difficult. And we sometimes use the scrotum as a part of it, which has been laser depilated completely. So that uh, that's what Miro also has done and probably has, has his results have stood test of time. Where you use scrotum, which has been laser depilated completely, where the hair follicles have gone off. Then only the scrotum can be used for inversion. Otherwise, hairs would go into the... But to combine a penoscrotal flap along with a sigmoid, we have never thought of it. But that's the innovation that you're teaching me today. And I hope if somebody I demands, I yeah. that's wonderful, I actually. And, you know, innovation is all about looking at believing into the other person and always listening to what people speak around. So I'm innovating myself and looking at what else can I do to stretch? Because it's all about stretching the imagination to the highest possible level. What we do today was not done 10 and 20 years ago, like the kind of vaginectomy we do has been actually hailed by EPATH and they said, this is amazing where you don't actually cause any injuries to the rectum, to the to the urethra, to the bladder by doing that kind of vaginectomy. Similarly, the, the spinal psychospinal fixation, which is completely innovation by us. So um, I gather that uh, we have that complex issue here and therefore we need to bring down the expectations to a proper level. You really cannot have uh, a, a transplant happening around, which could be a question from you, which is also a question coming from all parts of the India. But at this point in time, we have our own thing cocoon within the Hippocratic Oath. Got to be extremely careful if you're dealing with human patients who have got expectations. Who also sometimes may have realistic expectations, but sometimes it's stretched beyond imagination, hoping that a doctor across the table could do it. And therefore, we need to mellow down and look at what are we capable of. The first thing in Hippocratic Oath is first do no harm. So if I'm not capable of, I must confess that this is possibly not happening by me. I may not be able to do it rather than attempting heroics, which we will not do ever again. That's good. Thank you very much. Um, so we, we received quite so many questions. Uh, do you have anything to, to add or should we should we switch to questions? Yeah, please, please go ahead. I know there are questions around, but I'm only looking at giving them an idea that we are attempting to revitalize and redefine this important journey because every life matters and all questions matter because I want to convert this dysphoria to a pure euphoria. Absolutely, and I think it's really important and, and 
and precious for patients uh, or families and friends of these people uh, who are living this dysphoria to be able to to hear um, professionals such uh, such like you to to be able to understand more the surgeries and to see that beyond the surgeon there is also a human being who is completely able to to listen and to understand the subject and the, the problematics so i i really think it's it's very important so um, let's start with a question which is do you have any experience in peritoneal pull through technique for gender reassignment surgery okay great Good question from wherever it came. Thank you for asking this question. It actually adds on to the diversity of questions which would come in. I'm, I'm very impressed. So the peritoneal pull through has not been done by me beyond few cases, which were more for the MRKH syndrome to start with. So let's start that. It was initially being started in the MRKH and gynecologist colleagues did do it. Now, let me confess that that has not been a great surgery all the time because the kind of shrinkage which happens around the kind of depth we can create on that has not been of that which is expected. Remember, you may not be knowing what is expected of you because if a surgeon operates you inside the abdomen, inside the brain, it's not visible to you. But here, you're creating an organ which should look to your expectation, which should match to your expectation in functionality, should have an aesthetic and sensation. All those has not been matched by peritoneum to the huge level around. So it is a shorter depth, it shrinks, it possibly has not got that kind of versatility from the gynecological world, on the surgery which have been practiced on the MRK syndrome, which happened to be the kind of crooks from where we moved up and down. So I personally, after the first few experiences, have looked at a sigmoid colon as a much better tube already because you are looking forward to your tube in a space that you create in the perineum of an android pelvis called the vagina. And that vagina has got a tube or a lining. The lining is best by either a, a good kind of a flap, which is good thick, which has got sensations, Obviously, sensations are always external than internal. So peritoneal flap, to me, has not stood the best of time. In the last 12 years of travel across the world, I've not seen the best of reconstructive urologists in the Americas and the Europe's and Asia packs present or do or innovate on the peritoneal flap. I see. Thank you very much for this. Answer. So you have also a lot of people uh, saying hi and and thanking you oh, yeah. a lot for this presentation. Oh yeah, yeah. Right? oh yeah. Thanks. Thanks for attending. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Actually. So I'll go from the beginning. Um, so someone is asking where should he uh, do his uh, bottom surgery in India. So probably he has now the the answer, which uh, as you you gave your your email address. Um, also people asking, is it possible to see results? So from my my uh, side, it's. I cannot give any result from, from, uh, for example, phalloplasties with a, a device. But from your side, I don't know if you you have possibility to yes, share. Yes. So, so this is always an anxiety, and I respect that completely. You know, if we go and uh, buy a machine, we want to see its result, and there's a demonstration of a machine, be it a car or be it a washing machine. But when we look at a, a kind of a surgery being created uh, and recreated, and probably topped it up with multiple things around. I gather that there is there are things in medical science which is about privacy, which is about keeping a sanctity of the individual whom you've operated and who has traveled in journey. We come yeah. from that part of the world uh, in Asia Pac region where individuals want to move on in their life and many patients have requested to be kept their identity completely secret uh, for many parts of around. Some of these patients actually could not be identified as transgender by their own partners till they actually said we have undergone a surgery and have a call and said, did you operate this patient? I said, very much. And, and she had molded herself with hormones and with surgery and with a kind of dilatation, et cetera, et cetera. So let's confess that to talk about results in a public domain will be a little tight on our part. It is, it is then breaching the privacy of the medical ethics. But yes, a patient who's moving on a journey, we do uh, take a one-to-one -one discussion between them and the partners. Look at some of the pictures, but always remember, always remember this, that uh, showing a result about somebody else a decade ago and decade later, it'd be very different from your own result. For example, if you take a flight from London to New York, you don't go to the cockpit and see who is the pilot. He is a pilot who has who has man hours of although that many air time of flying and therefore he's going to take this important flight across the Atlantic. So to me at this point in time, I know we have a faith and faith can move mountains. That's what they say. That means you have faith in your medical doctor. You have done a Google on him. You know everything about him. And you go to him for treatment of your fever, for your cancer, and for an entity which is not a disease to me, 
but an entity called gender reassignment therefore doctors across the world and my colleagues who practice the subject as a team or as individuals are very learned individuals and i respect each of them because when we shake hands let me tell you blanche the, the handshake is not dead and deadly we go to shake hands soon with my colleagues across the world when we shake hands with these colleagues around and look at the innovation that they've done in their clinics for their kind of patients who come in around respect that the identity that they've kept completely so identity of the patients are always kept a little bit not hidden but obviously we do a one to one discussion both for phalloplasty which have been tremendous results patients have actually come up and spoken for us for example in the urology society of india national conference two of the male to female patients came live talking okay. to the entire media and uh, there are pictures to show you that they have moved on in life they both live both live in mumbai mumbai they have been accepted by the society by the workplace by their partners by the family back and now they are respected better so to me they are live examples who happen to play ambassadorial role also the patients who do come in do come in with that kind of an, a referral but i respect that everybody needs to know more and therefore when we are working and we are moving forward in the journey we do show results to them for them to feel confident absolutely and also people can can try to contact uh, ancient patients of yours or uh, i know this the the trans community is huge and it's it's quite easy sometimes to go into if facebook groups for example and be in touch with very um, uh, benevolent people They who do. can help with of results Uh, we have a question about the age of surgery. Someone is asking: Is it possible to have surgery before the patient turns 18, like when they are 14 or 16 years old? I know a, a psychiatrist uh, evaluation can be done early right now. I want to know if it is if it is possible actually. So that will be a little bit against both the laws and the science because once you are adolescent, you are really capable. That's the time you identify yourself into everything. you at that time of focus with so many things with your career with your parents moving on to hostel life and you also have found that you are entrapped it will be wrong on our part living in this part of the world not to follow the rules of the land the transgender bill had been passed in parliament on 26 and i did speak on my ted talk on that and you could go to that and listen to that and see that bill which has been described out there so it is all about looking at uh, not being operating something who is not a major who cannot make his or own decisions we have operated people from the age of 21 22 onwards who have come uh, to the age of 40s and 50s even we have a patient late 50s who wants to undergo this and we understand we counsel them over multiple sessions because every surgery irrespective of age has to be proven multiple times at least twice by wpath rules with the psychiatrist yes and then still i need to be very sure what am i doing because it's important for me because i am giving that irreversible step as a surgeon and the team i means the entire team of the three urologists and the plastic surgeons and the entire team we look at it from a very different angle to play safe so very young minors would require a, a more of i would say a continued psychological support yeah. moving mm-hmm. forward in the journey with psychiatrist and and clinical psychologist in the country where they were they are in a city they are in and then to understand the maturity as it comes in maturity do comes earlier than age in many patients around but then we look at the maturity in terms of chronological age which is 18 to 21 beyond that we look at asking the parents asking the peers asking the workplace looking at everybody before we get into something which could be completely yes. different i see thank you so we have another question which is a double question actually which is what are the medical challenges one can have if she is planning for surgery in her early 40s or late 30s also the same person is asking we are planning for future surgeries considering the current pandemic situation like i was supposed to go through the surgery in april end but it was put on hold so how soon can we have that so these are very good questions and uh, thank you so much for putting them live for us to speak to you directly so the first question is late 30s and early 40s so it was that you had something which was more important in life and i respect that you also understood yourself and took the journey in your city and your country with your colleague in medical fraternity and you wanted to move that step slowly till you undergo to the reaffirmation phase of surgery uh, so there is nothing major in terms of age when it comes to later in the age it's all about ablating and reconstructing when it comes to both ftm and mtf it's all about reconstructing if you are not having major comorbid factors of diabetes and immunosuppression and thyroid issues which are too much gone deep into the jungle from where we can't pull you back medically that gets a little tight on the medical team to look at otherwise 30s and 40s are most of our patients too 
though we get more of late 20s and early 30s that's when they have got into their uh, from their curriculum into the job they've got things listed they've got the money matter sorted out because in india it's still not completely insurance based people have to pay money for that compared to where we operated in montreal and in amsterdam where i got patients who were covered completely and it was great to look at that so uh, late 30s early 40s is not a issue it's completely about you taking your journey beyond that and looking at your workplace your family your partners and settling out so medical challenges are close to none we are looking to looking at optimizing you at whatever age you come in and looking at safety of you first both from an anesthesia point of view and from hormone point of view so if you're starting your journey late 30s there was some reason compelling enough you were suppressed and you were probably looking at waiting for it but if you are in the journey and you want to undergo the last surgery at that age completely fine the team will take care of you and you are in the best of hands wherever you are as regards the covid time the medical fraternity has sadly slowed down but has not completely gone off that means the medical fraternity has decided to look at more challenging situations right now which are the semi emergencies and emergencies and remember these are all very planned surgeries for example if i do a prostate surgery in a patient who has undergone retention of urine there's no emergency to operate we leave a catheter and forget him keep him on medicines it can be for a week a month even 6 months like in the nhs waiting times but when you look at something which is an emergency we probably rush through in an hour in a day or as early as possible so kindly don't rush through in covid times because these are challenging surgeries no surgeon worth his salt in this kind of a subject across the world of 90% of whom i know so well right now would be very keen to take such challenging surgeries as a primary surgeries at this point in time if you have surgeries for corrections or something as good as retention of urine where the urinary passage is blocked the intrauterus is blocked or things of that kind surgeons would love to take care of you and bring you from a semi emergency to a non emergency situation mm-hmm. so covid times should pass off in your city your country your the medical team should feel very good to take it forward please and give it time to absolutely we should be patient that it will we we already see in some countries it, surgeries are almost back to normal so we should just be patient so we have a question about uh, about uh, scars uh, when do the phalloplasty any techniques are you following to do minimal scars that's a wonderful question uh, only because i am on facebook live i could not have shown you those pictures yeah. we did innovate and possibly you could see that in one of my presentations or on my youtube channel i think i may have a picture even on my ted talk too is all about giving just a simple scar to you uh, on the hip joint which is completely mm-hmm. invisible so though it was in era when everybody talked about radial forearm flap as a gold standard the patient is then left uh, to be dressed like uh, blanche or like me with covered hands which is not a great idea because the scars are too deforming many a times especially in thin individuals all of the circumference is gone so the era is gone where a patient wants to wear these kind of dresses they are all wear wearing the trendy dresses around and they don't want to cover the scar with multiple of these tattoos that they used to do around mm-hmm. so in today's world as i see the patient has undergone a transformation in a decade of life they want lesser number of scars and the scars are morely concealed if we do that kind of a skip flap or a prior flap or hidden flaps around so we do not a scarless but a minimal scars i think those patients who underwent those surgeries 7 and 9 years ago have still been on follow up even on a video consult i asked them whether the surgery was on the right or left the scars almost disappear and merges gradually and takes the body contour and the color mm-hmm. i see um we also have a question about the success rate in of phalloplasty in india if you have any numbers of or yeah, so i must i must i must be very candid when i talk this we are all innovative and taking it forward to the highest possible level there are a set of plastic surgeons who have attempted to do radial forearm flap remember urethra is the most important part of the entire stuff because that's where the mind is about standing and being and being able to perform coitus etc the urethra has not done very well when we have done a radial forearm flap because of the junctions which are tightened up and we have ended up not doing a urethrotomy but a urethroplasty to me radial forearm flap i gave it up 10 years ago because i understood that that will not be the best so that not that i am on discordance with my plastic colleagues who actually have been doing it across the country in many centers but i find the complication rates are higher in terms of the cordy which comes around mm-hmm. the kind of expectations they have while the organ shrinks and turns into tightened organ and urethra goes away into fistulae the hand as a donor organ goes into troubles to me it is always a pedicle flap at this point in time unless it's a redo surgery we have taken the pedicle flap of the skip kind from the hip joint area as a broad flap approximately 8 to 10 cm 
folded that, given a phallus, brought it into a central location in a strategic point, kept it there. That has been a test of time to me. That's sharing to a gold standard, except that it doesn't have the best of sensation at the tip. Compared to a cis man who's got the best sensation in a gland shaft, this may not have the best of sensation. Its sensations are good enough in the proximal tooth. Compared to the prior flap, which is more capable, provided it succeeds, and therefore we need to choose the right individual for the right thing. I've been a little wrong in choosing some of these patients on their request and possibly more than request a demand, where they were a little on the obese kind and therefore the pedicle flap did not work and we had to explant the phallus in few cases. So to me, the pedicle flap have stood test of time. Patients start accepting an organ. And to me, these two flaps have done very well. The ALT flaps have also been practiced in few of my patients. You know? And I gather that, again, we use A for A and B for B and C for C. That means we match. We look at their body contour. We look at their height. We look at their abdominal wall, panis, and the fat. We also look at their understanding on the subject and are they ready to run a mile with us and be a partner in the journey that we are fulfilling for them. So the results have been quite variable. We've had our own complications, which have been also explantation in the past, which have been quite success rates in aesthetic and functional cases that we put forward to. So there is no one single phalloplasty we do. We do a range of phalloplasty and therefore we choose a patient and give them the best. They also understand and choose it and come realistic. I see. Uh, I, do, do you still have a little bit of time because we received quite some I have time. Okay. I have time to answer because you've got Pan Europe and Pan Asia around. I've Thank got time. So we have a question uh, which is what do you think will be the next big thing for FTM surgeries? And, uh, and you have asked me that question with the Urology Society of India it has put forward on 30th of uh, June uh, sorry on, yeah, on, on probably on, on, on 2nd of July for a national mm -hmm. debate. So to me, I am looking forward to this, that my uh, waiting list on the phalloplasty grows for umpteen reasons of uh, economic constraints, travel, reach, various countries. I know that they also are set in mind when they come for phalloplasty. There are important things to look at. We need to one step forward, improve our own phalloplasty results and our metodioplasty results to whatever we have 10 years ago. And we have improved that. We innovated steps. We also need to look at and put a national debate about organ transplantation and looking at penile transplant as an important subject. And thank you for giving this platform and the question because I've been wanting to answer this question. Because, you know, back in India, we have got ethical considerations. When you remember, transplantation is to save somebody's life, which means that we are saving somebody's life for a patient who has got end-stage disease. And end-stage diseases are heart, liver, and kidney, apart from lungs and other organs around that's why cadaver, cadaver transplant has stood tall in India over the last decades. And maybe the father of cadaver transplant in India, Professor Shroff, who took this challenge upon himself as a profession, taking it forward as a urologist, did talk to me on this and said that there is a time to move on and you will have to look at this subject on your own, helping the, the body and things to move forward. So understand that penile transplantation could be an organ which is already formed by God or formed by natural circumstances, which has got capabilities. And penile transplant has already been performed across the world, albeit lesser numbers. So apart from improving our own results, apart from doing a teamwork, apart from using your implants, which are the most innovative implants for gender reassignment surgery, both male to female and the vaginal mold. I forgot to tell you, do you have a vaginal mold to show me? Do you have a vaginal mold to show me? So we use the dilators. Yes. So that was something missing in my textbook completely. And I'm going to order a few of them for our country, which actually helps us expand that wound and keep it in place, and that's great enough. So it helps the expansion. So you have innovated it. So the, the next, uh, the question that you asked me should be answered by you as to what will you do next to help us innovate it around. So I look yes. forward to penile transplantation for FTM. For male to females, I'll still look at your molds and your implants and dilators around. And this is great enough that I've not used the mold, but I've seen it, and I've heard about it from my European colleagues. And I'm looking forward to that mold helping us out in shaping the the kind of shape that we gave to the vagina in an android pelvis. So can you can you show me that filled up kind of thing around? So when you ask me this question, there's somebody lurking who wants to know that's the kind of vagina which we create and that's the kind of mold which will help me to give it that stretch for the first 24 to 48 hours and the patients to be able to give a stretch to the matured part and where they use that. So that's the important question. We're all looking at innovate because we are looking at life saving, life changing, life modifying and life extending therapy on these patients who deserve to get this after background of years of existence. Absolutely. And on our part, we hope to have an electric 
Sun Phoenix. This is our impressive. Brand. So you are an innovator. We're looking forward to you becoming a Tesla and an Apple soon on this. Good. Yes, I, I hope to be able to to travel to India next uh, beginning of year, beginning of next year. So we have more questions about. Um, mm -hmm. So we will keep on FTM uh, questions, and then we will switch on the the sure. more about vaginoplasty questions for MTF. Um, so someone is is asking. I am 30 years old, and I am have I and I have type two diabetes. I am diabetic type two. I have uh, psychological problems, and so does it mean I cannot go for surgeries? So to start with, uh, you are not 30 years old. You are 30 years young. Number one. So you are, you are fit to undergo surgery by all standards. Psychological stability is extremely important. Remember that it is not a Skype consult where I define psychology. There is a full workup by a psychiatrist and another set of psychiatrists blinded to each other. So if you define yourself that you're not psychologically stable, we've got to define that for you. All psychologically unstable patients do not get a morphobia or changing of their, their organs without being psychologically stable. We have refused close to a dozen patients out of a few hundreds that we have done and seen only because we did not find them psychologically stable. So psychological stability is a requirement. Diabetes has got nothing to do with it. You may be a diabetic. Your diabetes needs to be a lifelong journey of maintenance. Diabetes is a part of your name. Sex diabetic. So diabetics are all going to be continue to be diabetic till you get islet cell transplant. You're going to be diabetic. So maintain your diabetes to high levels because that will help the healing and the maturity of your organ to be created by the team. To me, you are 30 years young and you're fit for a surgery. Unless you are not going to be stable, no team should take you forward because tomorrow you cannot come and say that I want to become from she to he or he to she. You have been defined, you have been given. I, my first slide was talking about transformation is irreversible. You can't be reversed. So don't look at instability as a component of uh, getting into surgery and transformation. Thank you for this precision. It's very important. Um, and also, depending on the country, some the, the psychological part is very important. And some countries, like France, they ask for uh, sometimes two years of uh, psychi psychiatrist uh, journey before being able to have hormone therapy and everything. So it, it's an important, yeah. So can I can I answer one thing? There are patients who have started the journey a few years ago, mm -hmm. or maybe a long time ago, and they actually, uh, you know, underwent a psychiatric opinion and double psychiatric opinion. But WPATH rules, they were very clear. They came in, they started their journey by a hormone therapy with Dr. Dheeraj Kapoor. And he took them on a journey where they felt very comfortable. They were fighting hormones and they got the right hormones they wanted. They then probably disappeared and did very well for n number of years and they come back for a surgery. Remember in that situation, it is important for a reconstructive surgeon and gender reassignment team to take another psychiatric opinion. It's mm -hmm. so important for us to know that they are stable enough to undergo the transformation surgery. They have moved on in life. They're happy. Why have they come back for a surgery? Possibly they, are, they have a need for that. They waited for a time on economics, balance, family, and partner. But at the same time, they're psychiatrically stable. So that's an important aspect. Thank you. About metoidioplasty, we have a question about, do you recommend using the external lengthening device after metoidioplasty? Like so, to, uh, uh, to maintain the length. Wonderful. So your question was answered by Miro, and I did ask him the same question. And that uh, the entire video will be on the YouTube, uh, maybe in the next 48 hours on my channel. You could look into that. And Miro answered it gracefully. He said that this is an organ created for that purpose only, for an individual who agreed that this will be my purpose. Stretching it only is to prevent a fibrosis because all organs that we operate undergo a shrinkage to some degree as a result of fibrosis. Not to let that fibrosis happen and not to let you demean yourself that I got a shorter organ. We need to continue the stretch on the organ to feel comfortable, at least to stand and pass urine. So for a metoidioplasty, the main purpose to stand and pass urine, to be able to see the organs, it is important to continue the stretch and the stretching devices for the early part of the surgery, which could be for the first six months or maybe three to nine months. Okay. That's how the fear uh, invented this, this very small device, which is a four millimeters. Um, it's like a, a Seisman uh, penile implant, actually, but it's very small. It is for techniques that are not the same techniques as uh, what is done in Belgrade. So it's for different methodoplastic techniques. And this is 
supposedly helping to, to maintain Implant. the lens and avoid this fibrosis yes. and shrinking. So I must come to it. Yeah. So that technique where we can actually implant it on the corporal bodies, which have matured very well with testosterone therapy, is a good way. For this kind of materioplasty, which you talked about, which is a non-Serbian way, we have done that. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not implanted, but I'd love to implant is some of those demands which we have is where we remove them completely out of moorings of the bone. So they're completely stretched and mm -hmm. keep them elongated and stretched by preventing a fibrosis on the on the penile bodies. But these are for patients who have undergone a little longer on the hormone therapy. So the corporal bodies are bloomed up into their full fledged corporal bodies. And those micro kind of implants are absolutely innovative. On one way, you've gone to inflatables and malleables and fixators. Other way, you've gone to the micro devices ZSI. And congratulations on that because that really helps the metaodoplasty in the right and the needy individuals. So mm -hmm. all may not require it. Tomorrow, an individual could not come and ask me that, please implant me on my corporal bodies because it's not huge. But then I would look at, if I'm doing a non-Serbian technique, possibly that could be okay. Could I be. could do it, but there is a limitation on the metaodoplasty technique. Yes. Uh, we have a patient of yours who is saying, I am Dr. Sanjay Pandey's patient. I have had successful phalloplasty, so thank you for this feedback. You showed us the penile implant, so it would be this one, for example. Um, it looks good, but will this be a lifetime solution? And what, what if after 10 years? So I'm not sure about what if after 10 years of using this device. Um, I, ca I can answer that if you want. So, uh, so the question is awesome. Uh, thank you for uh, thank thank you for logging in and and uh, thank you for maintaining your organs so well. The surgery and the journey that you undertook in Kokila Bain Hospital with Dr. Bijoy, Dr. Ismail, and myself. To me, at this point in time, the journey of implanting we have moved forward. Uh, we already have innovated Shah's processes and taken it forward. When I look at ZSI implants, which Blanche is showing, and we will be using it now, is about uh, more of a experience from my colleagues. At the same time, I see that. It's a wonderful implant. To me, that implant should be fitting in around. That implant has got all the properties I was seeking in my lifetime. So mm -hmm. 10 years is quite a journey in gender reassignment surgery, seven days a week kind of thinking and innovating and planning on this. And I did put it on my YouTube channel too, looking at, okay, do we have a better implant for patients who have futuristic kind of things? So even if I look at the best of innovators in the past on the cis men, that means mm -hmm. the American medical systems and the Boston Scientific, I still understand that 10 years of implant in cis men also has been a great innovation. Around. We sometimes need to explant and re-implant. These organs undergo a change. I'm only 12 years into this journey and I understand that in a 12 years or the 10 years of surgery and 12 years of the clinic, I have not explanted anybody for the reason even the Indian processes because it are not stood test of time. It did not stand because it got infected. It did not stand because it got explanted on its own for reasons to remove. But those who have got the implant have stood test of time for n number of years already on not maybe a lesser implant, but on a on a lesser innovative implant, because these are all robust implants we have in India, compared to the implants that you're creating, which are now structured implants for transgender. So they should stand test of time, and 10 years later, we should come back with more innovatives, and possibly ZSI would allow us to exchange it. Let's hope you can try them uh, very soon. Uh, so we have uh, many, many questions. I will try to be quick. Uh, so let's go back here. So do you have, um, does your hospital provide laser therapy for M2F patients? Okay, and which so, uh, so you know, uh, you know, Blanche, that's a good question. And I encourage uh, patients to do one thing too. Patients come from different cities in different countries. And I, and I request them to look into many of these aspects pre-surgery in their yes. cities and their countries too. It does not mean that my colleagues in various cities in the country in endocrine therapy and in various other therapies are lesser than that. We have formed a team. We are a role model right now in gender reassignment because we have teamed up completely and got into that teamwork. But I gather that to come to Mumbai to get into all these aspects on gender reassignment may not be very easy. And therefore, many patients do call me, can I have a psychiatric workup? I said, do the first psychiatric workup there. Our yeah. one will be blinded and look at that. So it does not add to the toll of arriving, living in a city, getting it done. So that it answers the question that a hospital do, does have a laser workup on that. But I would suggest that these things are being done very well with colleagues in various other fraternities who know the subject now that we have spoken loud and clear for a decade from various platforms in the country. The subject has come to its real existence in the country mm -hmm. that it got the parliamentary affairs and that I gave that TED talk, which has been heard by everybody in the country. I'm sure you will hear and know that there's been a wanted kind of a TED talk we created for 16 minutes. So don't worry about everything being done at the Kokilabin Hospital, which is capable of 
if you choose it and if you are a part of the city you come can come and spend that amount of time because a laser therapy for completely uh, taking off your hair follicles are multi stage it's not a single stage single stage laser ablation there was somebody in your city could do well where you could finally define and say i got gone it 6 months ago 1 year ago and it's not any more hairy i can come for surgery welcome in walk into the place and get a surgery so this laser therapy in your hospital should be done by people living in mumbai otherwise they should try to find a, a solution yes. in their own yes. city because it's it's a very long uh, time yes. uh, so i have extended team across the country i have got extended team across the country who's helping us out in the journey for you so anywhere and everywhere you can get it done thank you so we have questions also about uh, i sent you this question because we received them uh, earlier actually Go ahead. um what is the resting period that you advise in your hospital post surgery for people coming from abroad or from another city so for patients who come from other cities around our discharge uh, for the first stage on f2m main thing between 7 to 10 days seventh is the earliest day mean because they will to walk the scar is healing it's not stretching and opening up compared to m2 f4 have again been discharged anything but 9th to 13th day with their own comfort so we're not kept anybody back beyond 7th day i don't discharge patients as early as in europe because they walk into their homes next door or they they go back to the cities okay. there are colleagues practicing the same subject and and hand in glove helping the colleagues or the primary surgeons it was out here it has been a little different altogether these complex surgeries have not been practiced in india to very high levels as the teams have not been created patients do rest back home and keep reporting on the mails on the phones i have not been very privy on the phone sadly but i need to understand in today's era we need to connect with these patients we store mm -hmm. their numbers we connect with them and a rest is good anything from few weeks for them to get back to the work when they can walk they can also run when they can run they can also go and they can come back to so it's a lot on them as the scars do stretch and heal or oh, males to females 7 to 10 days later they are doing well and most of them understand it because it's been a journey of understanding as we move mm -hmm. i see um so during the surgery which would be your priority if you had to choose would it be aesthetics or sensation or function functionality it is a tricky question <laughs> so that is that is we always have a balance where two things are balanced out here three things to be balanced so you got to be very ethical to first of all in the surgery very ethical actually you don't want to rush through and do many numbers no no gender reassignment team and surge, a surgeon wants to do huge numbers for god sake please understand that they only want to do good to you because back the ingrained motto in our lifetime as a medical person and in this building is every life matters we improve your quality so to me aesthetics functionality capability and to look at that along with ethics is all about giving a right and a proper organ so we balance that for example demanding a phantom organ which could be too big or demanding an organ which could be too beautiful is not so important this is a hidden organ understand you want it for functionality you want it also for aesthetics with your partner we also want to look at it function that balance will be always tough and that's why we are looking at could in times to come my students and maybe beyond penile transplantation would be a way forward because ethically morally it could be that ratified in times to come therefore we echo those sentiments for generations to come that things could work possibly and it would only be anastomosis to be done at that point okay. um does your hospital conduct any any sensibilization about trans um trans people's care specifically or not not specifically is there a, a group of of uh, of yes. talk yes yes very much very much uh, when the when a uh, consulate general of a country consulate general of a western country watched me speak on this subject mm -hmm. he was a chief guest he said i want to meet you in privacy and i traveled to the consulate office as a guest to be able to speak and take it forward to highest level on the care of transgender patients mm -hmm. so there are people in society as high as a consulate general of a country and as much as non governmental organizations and organizations which take care of this so we understand that uh, the journey about taking them forward in a surgery is not our primary journey we understand there is a diversity in the unity that we have in the in the country and we look forward to rehabilitating them back at home and at work my primary job in these two things is to ask them questions is your workplace ready with you and is your home ready with you many a times this is a discordance many a times in the past before that they may have lost their jobs and lost their homes because parents and peers don't support but things have moved in a country now the homes are supporting parents as high as fraternity as doctors and engineers have come in and said my son and my daughter is a transgender 
and I am not surprised because I understand it. So we take it forward. So there is a group beyond me which takes care of these people around and there are organizations which are ready right now with open arms to accept transgenders. So we have policemen as transgenders. We have got army men as transgenders. We have got bus drivers and conductors as transgenders in the country in various cities. These are role models operated by us and by various colleagues and they have moved on. So the city moves forward, the country moves forward and the support is always there. We look forward to their organization supporting them higher than the Right, and some some people are a little bit worried sometimes to go to to consultations because or to hospitals because they fear that probably you are a thousand percent um, aware of the the difficulties a trans person can face with with the pronouns or the names and everything. So, is your hospital um, uh, aware, or at least the the, the branch Wonderful. of the hospital aware of? Wonderful question. That's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking. That has so much of sensate uh, behind it because as a hospital, uh, the promoters of the hospital, since when we started this whole subject, are very sensitive to quality of life needs of individuals in various uh, specialties, including those patients who have got no diseases, like the psychiatry, where there's no disease per se. They're sadly going through an agony where the family needs to support them. So the hospital has been sensate right down from the promoters down to doctors to the, you know, the staff who are the nurses and the paramedical staff, everybody takes that understanding. When we label somebody as gender dysphoria and getting them admitted, nobody would laugh at them. They would smile and be friends. That's important. We take them in the journey of nursing. Very, very important. And I, I hail Kokilabin Hospital very proudly in that situation. As much as my forward institute, Ramachandra Medical College, where we did start the early part of this work around where the staff is so sensitive because as a doctor, I could see n number of times or only nth amount of time, but the mm -hmm. staff rotates around, takes them forward in the healing process of medication, journey, surgeries, very important. So the anesthetists who have been a part of this journey, the endocrinologist, the doctors, the medical staff, even the counters who actually ask you, are you a male or a female? They don't ask you when it's mentioned as gender dysphoria. They don't ask you that. That means they make you very comfortable not to feel uncomfortable. And the patients are good enough, they stand tall and say, I am a transgender, I am a gender dysphoria. So I think from both sides, both from the patients and from the doctors, the society has moved forward and I feel extremely proud of this. Right. It is a good news. It's very important. So I have a, a, another question and I think I, I will free you because it's been quite some, I don't know what time it is in India, but probably It'll be fine. around It'll be fine. Tea time <laughs> or tea time. Um, so we have a question about, is there any chance of facing breast cancer? Is there any complication in future after transformation? And how much time it takes to heal and go back to work after surgery? So I think it is about uh, M2F um, surgeries, actually, this question. Yeah. So the first thing on M2F is to get back to work. Uh, it could need surely a few weeks. There are patients who have agreed to actually take a leave from anything between six to three months. So they understand and they say, I want to reform myself on the transformation. Mm -hmm. Reformation will come with me being capable of keeping this organ stable, which you created for me. At the same time, I want to move on in life and be good enough to go back. So they have been on hormones. So they are understood that when they go back, nothing is visible because their transformation is already on the hormones. They could go back to work as early as three to four weeks to as late as few months if they want to, number one. So once they are good enough, they get back to work, number one. They are mm -hmm. on a follow-up. After first two weeks and after a month, so they are always told what they need to do according to the healing process that we ascribe to them as it's happening. Regarding the M2F breast cancer, so we are creating implants and there is no worry about breast cancer. So if somebody is M2F, it could be a male breast cancer happening around, but the breasts are actually implants, so that's not a worry because that's an implant. What could be a worry actually in M2F could be a prostate cancer. And that could come in future. Maybe it should may or may not come in my lifetime, but prostate is under known to undergo an involution when the, it's minus hormones. So if there is no testosterone going in, the prostate undergoes a shrinkage. We in 20 patients did a transrectal sonography uh, to look at the prostates and we could understand there's an evol involution process happening in a few years time, which means that the prostate still will become very small and shrunken and in lifetime may not completely disappear. It's a part of the urinary process embedded out there as a male organ deep inside, which has not been removed. So in my lifetime, in the last 12 years in the subject and 10 years into this, and I do prostate cancer surgery robotically, I've not had a patient yet 
of any other any other country or any other uh, science or subject who has come in around and said i am a transgender i have got a prostate cancer so that will be a little if and but and as time comes back we'll know that but to have a cancer in organs preserved and therefore we remove the uterus and ovaries as a primary procedure as much as breast in a female to me called these organs are not to be required or not desired or not a part of the process of a journey therefore these organs are removed because ease of these organs beyond a time are known to be the highest cancers in the world in a female body so if they're not required not desired and is a part of the legally allowed removable organ we remove it so that so need to be aware that undergoing a transformation still requires that you need to be a part of the process of being with a medical fraternity you can't just completely disappear so patients do go away and keep in touch and say hi and i'm good and any any problem they come back to you which may not be your domain but it's important that individuals who undergo a gender reaffirmation by gender reassignment surgery should be a part of the medical process they are always with endocrine but they move forward from them too because they are on hormones they need to come back to the gender reassignment so just looking at changes and not suddenly come back one day and say that the vagina is closed and please do me a sigmoid because you not been using you not been dilating them a doctor in front could be a better person and that is what i did speak and encourage people to listen to my ted talk which was basically on that the journey is completely on taking it forward to a very sublime level completely absolutely great yes i encourage everyone to watch this uh, very interesting and ted talk actually we we shared it on our page we will we will share it once more after this talk so to to close this we will probably receive a lot of, of questions so i will send them to you after this sure. uh, this live and uh, to close it i would like to 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 read you what dr puja diwan wrote uh so she sh she said she shared insights into the successful stories of dr pandey's patients in issues of fertility and she was heading the fertility unit in the same hospital as dr pandey and had laurels to add so this is a way to thank you doctor thank you dr puja for being around and you have been yourself a creator and innovator being a doctor and being a a, a, a singer you've done wonders to the country in the last n number of years uh people of your kind who have been in infertility expert there will be a challenge patients do come with expectations so that is again another lead innovation where challenges like dr puja and people will have to take it forward so to me at this point in time when i have to wrap it up i have only one and one motto that means if every life matters we are committed to this important life only when you reach your doctor in this journey you reach with a uh, understanding that you know your doctor already the doctor across the country and the world and uh, colleagues from america the whole of europe which is watching it live and so many medical fraternity colleagues who have logged in today from mumbai and from various parts of the country we belong to gynecology urology and all the other sub specialties including plastic and so many patients who have logged in live today to understand and take the journey forward more stimulating than anything else it is important to understand that uh, doctors who have been a part of your journey are important and drive you to continued work and research on this subject they attempting to innovate at kokla bin hospital and all those who have been a part of this entire journey of the subject and the hospital that has been a 12 years young hospital and to the 30 years young patient that i talk about i think we important to be continued to young in the subject because we have got innovators in in all fields the innovators in zsi i'm thoroughly impressed with uh, you know you are moved on and brought those things which you always thought in operating room and quizzed our minds and created is already ready to made and probably could be planned thank you very much well many many thanks to you for your uh, your time your very precious time and and dedication to this to all of your patience and this uh, very complex subject so thank you very much i will send you the questions that will probably appear and uh, we meet you soon in in mumbai hopefully <laughs> yes Plain before we come to a close yeah before we come to a close i must uh, put forward this important thing about this is the most amazing platform on gender reassignment that i ever had the, the 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 first and the best was when i reached serbia belgrade in 2008 and i knew that my journey could be fulfilled 12 years later uh, from that and 10 years after we created a gender reassignment clinic and believe me we have kept it very very silent silent for reasons of the patients not to get exposed for multiple reasons and patients do respect it people have come in from all over the country people have come in from each neighboring country i can name and i speak those languages which make them very comfortable and we go completely as a partner and team in this subject it has been a immense kind of a journey which with the team that surrounds us and helps us in the journey of patients around very silently and very softly 
to me this has been an amazing platform you created because today we're able to reach colleagues to stimulate them to take the subject we're able to reach colleagues in the audience who are patients uh, my apologies for the for them who, whose questions could not be taken because of the lack of paucity of time beyond one hour and 42 minutes. But we look forward to coming back again in many fora and helping you out. And if there are questions, you could put me on the mail, you could put Lancia on this completely, and you could put me, I mean, you could follow us. We put a lot on the Twitter handle. We put a lot on the YouTube. The, the World Congress, which we did, which Blanche, with your um, uh, help, 41 countries could watch live on a Sunday afternoon, was a landmark where Two important and two towering figures called Marlon and Miroslav joined in together to take it forward to high levels. We'll be on the YouTube channel for you to look at and we'll be on your Facebook also to take it forward to highest level. So thank Absolutely. you so much. This today's live will be will be shared on YouTube and it will be shared and, and, and also cut oh, nice. and, and put and more to more Congratulations. to come. <laughs> Congratulations. So much. Thank you. Be, be thank well. you again. Thank you so much. So I would say namaste to all of you and namaste. good enough. So signing off from Coquilaben Hospital from the, the from colleagues in the partnership of gender reassignment surgery. And to all patients across the world, uh, please salute Blanche and the entire team of ZSI for bringing all of us together. You all need to go back to your uh, gender teams across uh, to various parts of the world and salute them because they all take a real pride in taking the subject to highest level form. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.